of us, and today's message will be coming from Revelation chapter 20, and our text will be taken from verses 1 through 10. So if you have your Bibles right now, I would just invite you to open them and follow along with me as I read that passage of Scripture, and then we will begin to dig into what it has to say to us today in this moment. Beginning with verse 1 of chapter 20, it says, And I saw an angel coming down out of heaven, having the key to the abyss, and holding in his hand a great chain. He seized the dragon, that ancient serpent, who is the devil, or Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. He threw him into the abyss and locked and sealed it over him to keep him from deceiving the nations any more until the thousand years were ended. After that, he must be set free for a short time. I saw thrones on which were seated those who had been given authority to judge, and I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony about Jesus and because of the Word of God. They had not worshipped the beast or its image, and had not received its mark on their foreheads or their hands. They came to life and reigned with Christ a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy are those who share in the first resurrection. The second death has no power over them, but they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. The judgment of Satan is also spoken of here. It says in verse 7, when the thousand years are over, Satan will be released from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, and to gather them for battle. In number, they are like the sand on the seashore. They marched across the breadth and of the earth and surrounded the camp of God's people, the city he loves. But fire came down from heaven and devoured them, and the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of burning sulfur where the beast and the false prophet had been thrown. They will be tormented day and night, forever and forever. Today our message, and also next week, will be concerning the 1,000 years of heaven on earth. Let's look into that for a few moments right now. Revelation chapter 20 mentions a 1,000 year period of time. In fact, it mentions it six times in verses 2 through 7. This period of time has come to be known as a millennium. It is a compound word from the Latin which means 1,000 years. The millennium is that 1,000 year period of time when the Lord Jesus Christ himself will rule upon this very earth. He will usher in a time of peace, prosperity, 
and righteousness such as the world has not witnessed since before man sinned in the Garden of Eden. There are many who do not believe literally in 1,000 years of reign that will take place with Jesus as King. They believe that this is just symbolic language. However, there is more written about this future time than about any other event in the realm of prophecy. It is a time that the Bible refers to in a literal sense, and there is no reason to believe that it will not happen just as the Bible says it will. Therefore, those of us who believe the Bible is to be taken literally, believe that there will be a literal 1,000 year period of time during which Jesus Christ himself will reign as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And since there is so much said in the Bible concerning the millennium, there is no possible way that I could cover all the details of that in one message. Therefore, I just want to skim the surface and begin that look today for a few specific areas of this great period of time that will give us a little insight into what will take place during that glorious and wonderful time. At this point, it might be good to refresh our memories concerning the order of future events that we have been focusing on for some weeks now. First of all is the rapture. This, we believe, from biblical teaching is the very next literal event that will take place in the lives of the people upon this earth. Secondly, comes the tribulation. This will begin after the rapture of the church has taken place. Third, the judgment seat of Christ. This will take place while the tribulation is unfolding upon this earth. Fourth, the marriage supper of the Lamb. This too will take place alongside the tribulation period. And fifth, the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, that particular event will close the tribulation and will bring about the judgment of the nations as in Matthew chapter 25. The Antichrist and his armies will be destroyed and those who have their faith in Christ will enter into the millennium. Now, with that information in our minds today, let's look for a few specific areas of the millennial period that will help us to understand it just a little bit better. My friends, I want you to know that this is one thing you do not want to miss at any cost. You want to be sure that you are a child of God so that when this time comes to pass, you can join Jesus in his kingdom and reign with him for 1,000 years years. So the first point today that I want us to put to our minds is from verses 4 and 6. And it would be the Savior during the millennium. What will Jesus be doing during the millennium period? First of all, I want you to hear me. He will be reigning. 
At long last, the Lord Jesus Christ will sit on the throne of David, as spoken of in Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 through 7. He will rule the world, and he will do it in power, righteousness, and in glory. His reign will usher in a time of peace and prosperity like nothing the world has ever experienced before. His reign will finally bring justice and holiness to the world. The world has never had a ruler like this before. All human rulers are controlled by their lusts for power, for wealth, and for self-glory. Jesus, on the other hand, will reign in perfect righteousness. The millennium will be a time of almost perfect existence. Next, we need to understand He will, He will be ruling. The Bible tells us that Jesus will rule the world with a rod of iron in Revelation chapter 19, verse 15. Like a shepherd, Jesus will guide the entire population of this world. However, those who refuse to bow to his authority will be dealt with swiftly and harshly. Rebellion will not hear me, will not be tolerated in that day. Next, he will be, a, be receiving. In the day which we live, the Lord Jesus is viewed as some kind of a comical character by the world in which we live in so many ways. He's like a poor fool who got himself killed on a cross to many. However, in the millennial kingdom, he will receive the glory he has always deserved. All people from every nation will come and bow at his feet and worship the King of Glory. Instead of cursing his name, men will worship him and they will shout praise unto him. What a day! <laughs> What a day that will be, my friends. Isaiah 40, verse 5 says, And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and the flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. This verse tells us that man will finally be able to look upon the glory of God in that day, and it will be a time of glory unto him. So we can see just briefly in these passages a little bit about what our Savior Jesus Christ will be doing in this millennial period. Secondly, from verses 1 through 3 and also 7 through 10, we can see Satan during the millennium. Verses 1 through 3 says he will be jailed, in essence. For 1,000 years, the enemy of God will not be able to hinder God's work, tempt God's people, nor will he be able to work in the lives of the lost. He will be chained. He will be bound for the duration of of that millennial period, that 1,000 years of time. Right now, Satan is the god of this world, as spoken of in 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. He spends his time doing everything in his power to hinder God's business, trip up God's saints, and claim souls for himself. Note, 
the titles given to him in verse 2. He is a wicked and evil enemy. Remember that always. However, in that day, he will be out of the picture. Imagine a world. Just think for a moment and imagine a world ruled by Jesus with no influence of Satan. Verses 7 through 10 speak of the fact that he will be judged. These verses tell us that at the end of the millennium, Satan will be loosed from his prison. He will return to the earth and will be able to amass an army of incredible size. He and this army will attack the city of God where Jesus is reigning and will think he can overthrow Jesus. However, divine judgment falls and all the people who follow the devil in his scheme will be destroyed. The devil himself will be thrown into the lake of fire and he will spend eternity in those terrible and horrific flames. His judgment is certain and his doom is truly sealed. The devil is headed to hell, my friends. When he is cast into hell, the universe will be forever free from his influence and his wickedness. Just to know the devil is going to burn in hell is enough, I think, that every born-again believer today should shout the victory. Does it bother you that even when Jesus Christ has ruled the world with perfect righteous judgment, Satan is still able to find a vast multitude to follow him? I know I've contemplated this many times in my own mind, and for a long time it disturbed me greatly. It bothers me, but it is a clear illustration of the heart of a lost sinner. No matter how good God is to someone, until they are saved by grace and changed by the power of God, they are wicked, clear to the very core of their being. In fact, I believe this is one of the primary reasons for the millennium period. It is to prove the hardness and sinfulness of the heart of men. You see, in various ways, God has tried to reach men, and each time man has failed to respond with love towards God. Notice, one, the age of innocence in Genesis 3 ended with the willful disobedience. Two, the age of conscience in Genesis 5 and 6 ended with universal corruption. Three, the age of human government in Genesis 11 ended with devil worship at the Tower of Babel. Fourth, the age of promise in Genesis 12 and Exodus 1 ended with the people of God in bondage in Egypt. Fifth, the age of law in Exodus 2 and Matthew 27 ended with humanity killing their creator on the cross. Sixth, the age of the church, as in Acts 1, will end with worldwide apostasy. 
and 7. The age of tribulation in Revelation 19 will end with the battle of Armageddon. And 8th and last, the age of the millennium in Revelation 20 will end with an attempt to overthrow God himself. The point is here that the human heart is terribly wicked and it is prone to evilness. There is no good in it at all. Romans 3, 10 through 11 speak of this. The only hope for man is to come to Jesus for salvation because only Jesus can change our hearts. Anything less will result in damnation and in hell. I ask you, sincerely, where do you stand right now with Christ? So we have looked at the Savior during the millennium today, and we've also looked at Satan during the millennium in this mess, part one of this message. Next week, we will begin from verses four through six, and we'll be speaking of the saints during the millennium period. And I sincerely hope that you will join us for the remainder of this message because it has some extremely important aspects that each of us need to be very well versed upon. So join us next Sunday at 8 a.m. Central European time for part two of this message from our series concerning the millennial reign of Christ. Please, I hope you will take the time to be with us. But before next week comes, let me ask you this today. How is your heart with God? Have you received Him unto your life? Have you accepted His salvation? Have you come to the place where you have made Him Lord and Savior of your life? Are you serving Him today? So much of the world, even within the church today, has been deceived. Oh, they say a lot of things. They say a lot of churchy terms. They may even attend church in a lot of ways. They may do this thing or that thing and say it's for the glory of God. But in their heart, it's not so. We need to be a people today who knows what it is to commit our lives to Jesus Christ and serve Him with our whole heart and our whole being and not allow the tricks of the enemy, not allow the things of this world, not allow the disruption of things that are taking place around us and the influence of others around us to take us away from God's love and will for our lives. I ask you again, have you come to Him? Have you asked His forgiveness for the sin in your life? And hear me, only Jesus can forgive your sin. But also understand, He has promised to do so, and He is ready right now. No matter what you may have done, no matter how you may have failed, His love for you is greater than any sin in your life. And if you will come to Him with a true repentant heart, He will forgive and He will set you free. Determine today Think about the things that we've been discussing for these past several weeks regarding the 
biblical teachings of the end times and determine in your heart and life right now you don't want to miss being on the side of the Lord Jesus Christ. Great things He has in store for His followers. And He wants you to be a part of that following. So if you have not come to Him, I invite you today to take a few moments and just call out to the Lord. Call out to Him and recognize Him as Lord and Savior. Ask Him to forgive you for the things that you have done in your heart and life that have been against His Word and His will for you. Acknowledge the fact that He created you with a plan and with a purpose that is far greater than anything you could ever know. And then commit yourself. Commit yourself to live each day for His glory and for His purpose. Well, you make some mistakes, of course. We're human. He knows that. But He is quick to assist us. And He is ready to help us grow and make less and less mistakes and be all that we can be for His glory and for His purpose. I want to be a part of that millennial reign of Christ. I want you to be a part of that millennial reign of Christ as well. So get your heart ready. Have an expectant spirit. He is coming, my friends. And with His coming will begin so many things that are simply amazing and wonderful. Right now, I'm going to pray for you. And I just invite you to join me as I pray with you today. Father, we come to you right now. We come in your precious and holy name. And Lord, it is my heart today that you will draw each one of us close to you and help us to understand the reality of your great love. I know for many, the things that we have been preaching about from your word might seem frightening. But Lord, the reality is they need not be that way because right now, no one has the uh, ability to go beyond that. In fact, all they need to do right now is to receive you as Lord and Savior. Ask your forgiveness and be ready for that time when you will come again. Lord, for anyone in this moment who has not received you as Savior and Lord, would you just draw them close right now and let them feel your love? Let them feel the touch of your Holy Spirit and help them to understand that there's nothing in their life that you cannot and will not forgive. You desire to set them free and you desire to equip them and make them ready for an eternity with you. If there are those that have done that in the past but have fallen away from that, they've not been living their life according to you, they've not been serving you, They've allowed the things of this world to steal away the victory and the joy that only you can give. Would you just once again speak to their hearts right now and draw them close? Bless them and help them to understand if they will just turn to you once again, you will restore all that has been stolen away and you will give them your love and your acceptance once again and make them ready for your glorious return. Lord, we need you in this moment. This world is growing so dark, so corrupt. But Lord, you are still with us and there is still opportunity for all that will to turn to you 
and receive your precious gift of salvation. And for the body of Christ today, for every individual who proclaims you as their Savior and Lord, help us to understand that we have a responsibility to be your witness, to help build up the kingdom, help build up your precious church that you love and gave your life for so that others can know the reality of your great and wonderful love. Help us to be faithful, Lord. Speak to our hearts. Encourage us to be all that we can be for you. Lord, we want to be ready. So I thank you today for speaking to each one of us and for loving us with a love far greater than any of us can understand. But Lord, knowing that you didn't call us to understand it, you simply called us to accept it and to walk in it. So we give you praise and we give you glory right now, all in your precious name. Amen.